Uh, last week I talked about a lot of things. One of them, you know, talked about the kingdom of God and how with Jesus coming, the kingdom's inaugurated, and then there's an interval of time, and then it will be consummated. And then what I want to do is I started talking about some aspects of the second coming, and I mentioned that the New Testament leaves no doubt that Christ will return. Jesus promises to return and speaks of his return in numerous passages of Scripture. Peter and Paul frequently speak of that event. Uh, John refers to the second coming several times. James, Jude, and the writer of Hebrews each mention the second coming. And even angels declare that Jesus is returning in Acts chapter 1. So Millard Erickson, who's a, a New Testament theologian in his book, Christian Theology, he rightly concludes, he says, certainly the second coming is one of the most widely taught doctrines in the New Testament. So it's not something, you know, it's not obscure. It's all over the New Testament. Now, the second coming described in Scripture is a personal return of Christ. It is Jesus himself who is coming back. Not simply the influence of his teaching or the consequences of his judgment. Jesus himself is coming back. In John chapter 14, verse 3, Jesus consoles his disciples regarding his imminent return to heaven by saying, I will come again and will receive you to myself so that where I am, you also may be. In Acts chapter 1, verse 11, the angels say to the disciples who just watched Jesus ascend to heaven, the angels say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, <clears throat> will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So he says, This Jesus that you just saw go into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. And in keeping with that declaration by the angels, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, that when Jesus appears, we shall see him as he is. Now, this personal return of Christ, it will be bodily, it will be visible, and it will be glorious. There's going to be no mistaking the second coming of Christ. It will be as obvious as lightning that lights up the entire sky. It won't be a question of, is he in California? Is he working over here at Subway, as you sometimes hear? Oh yeah, Jesus is in California. It's not going to be like that. Okay, there's going to be no mistaking it. Now, the time of Christ's return has not been revealed. As Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verses 32 and 33, he says, But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time is. And you see that in a number of other texts. Now, with the, with the Christ event... <clears throat> With Christ's coming, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, with that event, the end has drawn near. Okay, the end has drawn near in that the necessary grounds or basis for the final eternal state has occurred. It has come near because the grounds or basis of that event or that state has occurred. The victory has been won by Christ. His atoning death, it purchased not only our reconciliation, but that of all creation, which was cursed in conjunction with Adam's sin. There was a curse placed on creation. And so he has reconciled not only us, but all of creation. And from the time of Christ's redemptive work, the final state has been, as we might put it, a done deal. See, from the time of his redemptive work, the final state has been a done deal. All that remains is for the consequences of Christ's achievement to play out. Okay, now when the victory that has been won by Christ, when that will be cashed out, when it will be fully expressed, when God will send Christ to consummate the kingdom, to bring history to a close with the eternal state, that's a matter of God's unknown timing. You see, it is, it's a done deal that has been brought near what is necessary. The grounds and basis for it has, has happened. 
But when it will be cast out, when God will send Christ to consummate the kingdom and to bring history to a close, that's a matter of his unknown timing. Peter specifically cautions his readers in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, verses 8 through 10, not to allow the apparent slowness of Christ's return to become a cause for doubting the certainty of it. He tells them that God operates in his own dimension of time. He says, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So he cannot be judged by human perceptions of slowness. God operates in, a, in his own dimension of time. You see, with him, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. So you can't use that to say, wait a minute, uh, I'm going to judge him for being slow. All right, now, now, since Christ's achievement... Creation has been on the verge of the end. I've shown you this little poorly drawn diagram that I've done uh, to help you conceptualize the idea. This is from a 19th century pastor, a fellow named J.H. Newman, but it's cited in a number of commentaries. But you can see here, as long as this reality, you see history as we know it, continues, it does so on the brink of Christ's return And the consummation of all things. So you can see here history before Christ going toward the end, history after Christ. And then it skates on the brink of the consummation. On the end of of all things. However long God in his purposes extends the time since Christ, Christ's coming is ever at the door. You see that? And I like this little drawing. And so do other people. It just is, it's a nice picture to me of the concept. I have on other occasions used a rather mundane analogy. It's as if all the defenders in a football play were blocked so hard as to be knocked out. Okay, all of the defenders blocked so hard they get knocked out. Well, when the last defender is knocked out, the touchdown is already secure at that point. You see, it's a fait accompli. It is something that, that, that is certain. The only question is how long the runner will choose to take before crossing the goal line. Everybody's down. So if he chooses to walk, circle, dance, however long, but it's already happened. It's a fait accompli. All right, now, or you think of this, another example I've used to get this idea that I think is reflected up here. You can think of a will that calls for the executor to bestow on the heirs an inheritance at whatever time the executor chooses. The executor is the guy who administers the will. The testator is the one who makes the will. And then he has somebody who administers the will and you know, does what he has asked. Well, if you think, you think of a will that calls for the executor to bestow an inheritance on the heirs at whatever time the executor chooses, well, once the testator, the guy who makes the will, once he dies... The inheritance draws near in a sense that it may come at any time. And with the testator's death, see what's necessary for the exercise of the executor's discretion. That has occurred from the testator's death on. From the time of the person making the will, from his death on, the heirs live on the brink of the inheritance without knowing when it would arrive. You see, this is the concept where Christ has brought these things near through the death that accomplished these things. The grounds or basis of all reconciliation is Christ's atoning death. And with that, we skate on the end. Let me give you a quote from a New Testament scholar, a fellow named Douglas Moo, very well known. This is from his commentary on the letter, commentary on the letter of James. He says, With the death and resurrection of Jesus and pouring out of the Spirit... The last days have been inaugurated. This final age of salvation will find its climax in the return of Christ in glory. But, and here's the crucial point, the length of the age is unknown. Not even Jesus knew how long the last days would last. Mark 13, 32. What this means is that the return of Christ as the next event in the salvation historical timetable is from the time of the early church to our own day near or imminent. You see, it is on the brink in that diagram. On the, you know, ever at the door. Every generation of Christians lives or should live with the consciousness that the parousia, the coming, the return of Christ, could occur at any time and that one needs to make decisions and choose values based on that realization. So it was as true in James's day as it is in ours. We need to be patient 
and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And I've, I've read that to you. I don't know if to you before, but I've read it many times before. I like it. Another uh, quote I like is from a fellow named Robert Shank. I just learned that he died a couple years ago. Uh, wrote several uh, important books, uh, especially on election. But here's what Shank said. He said, said a, said a professor of theology whom I know. Now he's quoting this professor of theology. The apostolic church believed Christ would return in their day. He did not, and they were wrong. Other generations of the church believed that Christ would come in their day. But time proved them all wrong. If we expect Christ to return in our day, time will no doubt prove us wrong. And here is what Shank says. He says, not at all. In every generation of the church, all who expected Christ to return in their time were right. And all who did not were wrong, terribly wrong. Christ, the apostles, and the entire New Testament enjoin upon us no other attitude than to expect Jesus to return in our time. Whether he returns in our day is God's responsibility. Whether we expect his return is our responsibility for which we must give account. Whether he returns in our generation or not, we are wrong if we fail to expect him. In every generation of the church, the Lord is at hand. This is the time frame of the New Testament, including the Revelation. You see, so this idea there are precursors of Christ's coming, but all of those things can happen quickly. You know, I, I, it's, it's to me, it's like, so we expect him at any time. Do you mean at any second, at any moment? No, that's not how I understand it. I mean any time in the same sense that somebody who lives in a place where the weather is volatile says it can rain here at any time. He doesn't mean it can rain without clouds coming. He means they can whip up quickly. And so that's what I think. So you see here that we are to expect him and we are to live in light of that expectation. That feeds into, so it's not just, I say a lot, it's not just a matter of pie in the sky, who cares, let's forget it. It informs how we live today. Okay, and, it has, and, and I've used many times the example of the, you know, the television show Terminator. Or you could pick the movie. I just like the illustration because those people who had a vision of the future, they knew that the, that the machines were going to rule. There was a war. And so that vision of the future then completely dominated their lives. Why? Because they knew the future. They knew what was happening. Everybody thought they were crazy. They're here living their lives for the battle with the machines that's coming in the future. Everything. But who was crazy? They knew the future. And you see how it fills. It, it, it comes in and it affects how we live. All right. Talk about the resurrection of the dead. This is, of course, tied with... With Christ's return. Regarding the resurrection of the dead, there are a couple of direct statements about it in the Old Testament. Isaiah 26, 19, Daniel chapter 2. And there's some allusions to the resurrection in the Psalms. You see in Psalm 17, 15, 49, 15, 73, 24, and 25. But resurrection is not clearly spelled out until you get to the New Testament. You see, you have some mention of it, some allusions to it, but it's not really clearly spelled out until you get to the New Testament. In John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says, An hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth. You see, the time is coming when all who are in the tomb will hear his voice and come forth. And when he was questioned by Sadducees who denied the resurrection, he accused them of error and he went on to argue for the truth of the resurrection on the basis of the Old Testament. You see that in, in Mark chapter 12, verses 18 to 27. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 20, Paul says that the future resurrection of the dead is as certain as the past resurrection of Christ. It's that certain. And so you really see the resurrection. It is expressed and spelled out in the New Testament. Now, the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living, okay, those who are there when Christ returns will be transformed without death. Those who are dead will be resurrected. But the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living, it'll, it'll occur when the Lord returns. You see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 16. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and maybe other places. But this is going to happen. The resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living will occur when Christ returns. Both believers and unbelievers, the saved and the condemned, will be raised to life at that time. There are a number of passages that make that point. 
Now, it's important to understand that the resurrection that will occur at Christ's return is a resurrection of the body. Okay? It is a resurrection of the body. The body will be restored to life. I don't know how that strikes you. I've said this many times, but you never know if anything absorbs. You see, that is what resurrection is. It will be a resurrection that will involve the body at Christ's return. In other words, resurrection, it's not about the mere post-death survival of the spirit or soul. That's simply death. That's the definition of death. That's not victory over death. That's death. Death is what? It's when the spirit is separated from the body. Resurrection is victory over death. Resurrection involves a return of bodily life. And it's important to see that because, well, I'll say more about that in a second, but really the, the, the idea that, that somehow there's something wrong with the physical and, and that really uh, salvation things involves the escape from the physical. This is neither Jewish nor Christian. That idea is Gnostic. That, see, the material world is evil. That it was created by a lesser God, a demiurge, and that salvation is that the spark of of divinity within you escapes from this nasty, dark, physical world. That's not Christianity. Okay, Christianity is resurrection. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Paul says, And if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. He says in Romans chapter 8, verse 23, And not only that, but even ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves also groan in ourselves while eagerly awaiting our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The redemption of... Of our bodies. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, Paul says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they, they will be like his glorious body. You see, there is, there is, that, that's what resurrection is. It, this is the central idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Especially verses 20 to, 20 to 23, verses 42 to 44, and verse 49. Christ was raised bodily, was he not? The tomb's empty. Christ was raised bodily, and in verses 20 and 23 of 1 Corinthians 15, he's described as the first fruits of those who will be raised in his footsteps. He's the first fruits. See, our resurrection is tied to his so much so. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul says, We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. It's all part of the same harvest. Raise us with Jesus. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, 18, that he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstfruits. He's the beginning. We're the same harvest. He is the prototype. And we will be raised as He was raised. And He was raised bodily. He came out of the tomb. And that's how it's going to be with us. As I say, I don't know how this strikes you. This is standard Christian doctrine. I'm going to show you that in a second. But if this strikes you as odd, this is basic, standard, mainstream, understood doctrine. Nothing peculiar, nothing eccentric. But sometimes it strikes us that way because we have imbibed this Gnostic notion that, no, 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 what you do is you're going to be, you're going to escape. And we sing songs like that. You see. And we do that, and and I could point some of them out to you. Alright, Jesus said in, in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment. You see, this is the raising up. 
that will occur in the last day, according to John chapter 6, verse 39 and 40, verse 44 and verse 54. They're going to come out of the tombs. They're going to be raised up. You see, it is a resurrection just as Christ came out of the tomb. I love this idea. You see, I find it exciting, thrilling. So it's important to see that that in the resurrection at Christ's return, see, the body will be restored to life. That's important to understand. But on the other hand, the resurrection body, it's not simply a resuscitated natural body. Like what happened with Lazarus. It's not simply a resuscitated natural body. Rather, our natural body will be transformed into a supernatural body. What Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 44 calls a spiritual body. It's not going to be a resuscitation where you come out still subject to decay and death and all that. Not at all. It's going to be a supernatural body. Body. There's going to be a transformation. Paul does not say in 1 Corinthians 15, 44, that the dead body is raised a spirit. That's how this is taken sometimes. That the body will be raised a spirit. He says it is raised a spiritual body. The contrast is not between a physical, material body and a spiritual body. It is between a natural body. And a spiritual body. That's important. It is not between physical and spiritual. It is between natural and spiritual. Resurrection bodies are spiritual, not in the sense they're non-physical, which would be an oxymoron, given the inherent physicalness in the word body. You see, it would be crazy. In fact, Robert Gundry wrote a book on it, Soma, Body in Biblical Theology. There's an inherent physicalness to body. That's not what he's talking about, that the resurrection body will be non-physical. It's spiritual in the sense of being supernatural, in being imperishable, glorious, powerful, immortal. All the things he says in 1 Corinthians 15. It is going to be not natural, it will be transformed so as to be supernatural. The work of the Spirit. It will be immortal. It will be glorious. It will be powerful. It will be imperishable. This is recognized. Well, that's an odd idea. It's not odd at all. I could give you many, many people, leading scholars who understand this. Let me give you just two. Here's Gordon Fee. Oops. I should have clicked that when we had the text that I was reading. But there you have those. I read them for you anyway. Okay. How about that? Here we go. Gordon Fee. He says the two adjectives, natural sukakos and spiritual pneumatikos, are used with the noun body, soma, to describe its present earthly and future heavenly expressions respectively. This is guy. He's the editor of the New International Commentary on the New Testament series. Don't know if that means anything to you. It's a leading commentary series. He's published many commentaries. He's not inspired. That doesn't mean he's right. It just means he's a scholar and he's saying these things freely. So he obviously there is a consensus when he says this kind of stuff. All right. He says they do not describe the stuff or composition of the body. Rather, they describe one body in terms of its essential characteristics as earthly on the one hand, and therefore belonging to the life of the present age, and as heavenly on the other, and therefore belonging to the life of the spirit in the age to come. It is spiritual, not in the sense of immaterial, but of supernatural. The transformed body, therefore, is not composed of spirit. It is a body adapted to the eschatological existence that is under the ultimate domination of the spirit. It is not between physical and spiritual. It is between natural and spiritual. It is supernatural in the sense it has been transformed so as to be immortal, glorious, imperishable, and all those things that Paul says. Let me give you somebody else. Just give, I'll give you one other one. N.T. Wright, he's an evangelical uh, theologian, probably the best known evangelical theologian in the world. Doesn't mean he's right about everything. Do I have to say that all the time? Uh, doesn't mean he's inspired. Okay. Here we go. He says, from the start within early Christianity, it was built in as part of the belief in resurrection that the new body, though it certainly will be a body in the sense of a physical object occupying space and time, will be a transformed body. 
A body whose material created from the old material will have new properties. It is, of course, Paul, in a much misunderstood passage in 1 Corinthians 15, who sets this out most clearly and to whom many, though not all, subsequent writers look back. He speaks of two sorts of body, the present one and the future one. He uses two key adjectives to describe these two bodies. Unfortunately, many translations get him radically wrong at this point, leading to the widespread supposition that for Paul, the new body would be a spiritual body in the sense of a non-material body, a body that in Jesus' case wouldn't have left an empty tomb behind it. It can be demonstrated in great detail, philologically and exegetically, that this is precisely not what Paul meant. And I could go and I could quote to you scholar after scholar who understand that. So we have seized on this sometimes. That, but, but it's going to be spiritual body, so there's somehow that's contrary to the notion of physics. It's not. It's not, and that's not a secret. That's what I'm saying. It's not a secret that it's not. So it's, I think that's an important thing for us to grasp. I've said it, perhaps from your perspective, ad nauseum, but I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> Because it's important. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Does not bar all things physical from entering the eternal state. Paul says there, Now I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. He's referring to flesh and blood as presently constituted. You see, flesh and blood... That's subject to weakness, subject to decay, subject to death. Of course it can't inherit the eternal state. He's not saying that flesh and blood transformed, rendered supernatural by the work of the Spirit, so that's immortal, imperishable, glorious, that it can't inherit the kingdom of God. Christ's resurrection body. When Jesus came out, His resurrection body, Paul says in Romans 6, 9, was what? No longer subject to death. That's His resurrection body. It is no longer subject to death. Yet what does Jesus say in Luke 24, 39? How does he describe that body? Flesh and bones. Uh Uh-oh. Flesh and bones. Well, is it this kind of flesh and bones? Of course not. Because this kind of flesh and bones, look at it. It's getting wrinkles and marks. It's decaying. It's not suitable for the eternal state. But Christ's resurrection body, he could describe as flesh and bone, not meaning this natural flesh and bone, but meaning resurrection, physicality. And his body is the prototype. You see, he's the first fruits. So we will be raised and we will be transformed. Now, the idea that Christians will spend eternity as spirits in some non-physical realm This has seeped into much Christian thinking. I've said to you before, many years ago, when I was teaching a class at uh, the White Station Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee, this would have been before 1990, I was teaching, you know, young guys, I don't know, high school, college, I don't remember. But when I was telling them this, they were just sitting there, what? You know, and they had been raised in the church and had picked up this idea that it's going to be, you know, this non-material spirit like floating on clouds or something. And when I told them about the resurrection, it was like, wow, this is something. Well, that's because a lot of this, I'm telling you, has seeped into Christian thinking, but it's wrong. Listen to how Wright, N.T. Wright, what he says about this in his book, Surprised by Hope. This is a three-slider, so hang on with me. He says, mention salvation, and almost all Western Christians assume that you mean going to heaven when you die. But a moment's thought in light of all we've said so far reveals that this simply cannot be right. Salvation means, of course, rescue, but what are, but what are we ultimately to be rescued from? The obvious answer is death, but if when you die, all that happens is that our bodies decompose while our souls, or whatever other word we want to use for our continuing existence, go on elsewhere, this doesn't mean we've been rescued from death, it simply means we've died. That's what death is. And if God's good creation of the world, of life as we know it, of our glorious and remarkable bodies, brains, and bloodstreams really is good, and if God wants to reaffirm that goodness in a wonderful act of new creation at the last, 
then to see the death of the body and the escape of the soul of salvation is not simply simply slightly off course, in need of a few subtle alterations and modifications. It is totally and utterly wrong. It is colluding with death. That's what death is. And you're saying, that's great. That's the end. That's death. And Christianity and the resurrection is victory over death. He says it is conniving at death's destruction of God's good, image-bearing human creatures while consoling ourselves with the essentially non-Christian and non-Jewish thought that the really important bit of ourselves is saved from this wicked, nasty body in this sad, dark world of space, time, and matter. As we have seen, the whole of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, speaks out against such nonsense It is, however, what most Western Christians, including most Bible Christians of whatever sort, actually believe. This is a serious state of affairs reinforced not only in popular teaching, but also in liturgies, public prayers, hymns and homilies of every kind. I say we sing hymns like that. And what I do whenever possible is I I connect them to the intermediate state. But that's not always possible. But here's something. Like, let me read to you another, another, one more person on this. This is Roger Olson. Roger Olson is a, uh, he's a professor of seminary at Baylor University. His field of study is the history of Christian thought, historical theology. That's his field. Written many books on it. Okay? The story of, of Christian theology, one of them. The mosaic of Christian belief. Well, here's what, here's what he says in, in the mosaic of Christian belief. The bodily resurrection of all people at some time after death has played a prominent role in Christian teaching throughout history. In spite of a pronounced tendency among untutored lay Christians to focus attention on immortality of souls and neglect bodily resurrection, the fathers of the church, medieval Christian thinkers, All the Protestant reformers and faithful modern biblical scholars and theologians have emphasized the bodily resurrection as the blessed hope of believers in Christ. It would be impossible to discover any single point of greater agreement in the history of Christian thought than this one. I'm going to give you give you his next line. But think about that. This is a person whose field. He's a known specialist in his field, and his opinion is that it's impossible to discover any single point of greater agreement in the history of Christian thought than this one. The future bodily resurrection of the dead is the blessed hope of all who are in Christ Jesus by faith. Over two millennia, the church's leaders and faithful theologians have unanimously taught this above the immortality of souls and is more important than some ethereal intermediate state between bodily death and bodily resurrection when Christ returns. And yet, as we lamented earlier, it seems that the vast majority of Christians do not know this and neglect belief in bodily resurrection in favor of belief in immediate post-mortem heavenly spiritual existence as ghost-like beings or even angels forever with the Lord in heaven. And what I'm saying to you, I've said repeatedly, I'm saying it again, and Lord willing, we'll say it after that, is that the resurrection involves the body. That's what it is. Not this. This is transformed. But it is you. You see, you are not simply the soul or spirit. That's not the real you. You are a a compound. You are soul and body. That is who you are. Death is the separation of that. Resurrection is the reuniting of those things. And you'll be raised victorious over death, whole, and I like it. I don't know about you. All right, new heavens and new earth. Okay, she said when Jesus came out of the tomb, he was not to be touched. I think he says, because I've not yet ascended. He comes out of the tomb. He describes his body as what? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a resurrection body, flesh and blood, as he said, flesh and bones is his term. So, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting note about what does it mean I haven't yet ascended. And maybe we could talk about that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, you know, it's obvious from the empty tomb. I mean, I could, I could marshal many things about, and if you're more interested in this, if you go to my website, I have a paper on just called the resurrection of the body. And it goes on, and I could, you could marshal many of these things that show without question that his body is physical. 
I mean, it's obvious, though, from the fact the tomb's empty. Right? I mean, so I, I thought that was enough to make that point. And I don't know anybody who says that Christ, well, I can't say that. Who knows? Maybe somebody says it. But that he, he, his body, resurrection body, is physical. So, yeah, you're right. You know, people grab him and that kind of thing. He shows the nail marks. And All right, let me talk about the new heavens and new earth. Now, not only will our bodies be transformed to be suitable for eternity with God, but all of creation is going to be transformed. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. The whole place is getting a makeover. It's that big. It's that cosmic. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10, Paul says that God's will for the handling of the end of history, his will for the management of the completion of the ages is to unify heaven and earth in Christ. To unify heaven and earth in Christ. The eternal state which will come about in conjunction with Christ's return. It will be a redeemed and transformed creation. A heavenized creation. I said last week that was my word and I liked it. And John said that he likes heavenated. <laughs> He's just messing with me. He likes heavenated. He's going to get the patent on heavenated or or whatever that is. Right. So you, you see this transformed creation, this, this heavenized creation from which sin and all of its consequences have been expunged. God creates good, good, very good. And what happens? An intruder comes in. And the creation has been disrupted. Now, do you think God is simply tossing that away and saying, okay, Satan, you win that round? You defeated me in this effort? But I'll start again and we'll have another match and maybe we can have a rubber match after that? Or is he going to redeem creation? Well, Paul says he's redeeming it. And he's going to redeem it in conjunction with our redemption. The curse at that point will have been lifted. The curse will have been lifted. Revelation 22, verse 3. And creation itself will have been freed from its slavery to decay. Paul says in Romans 8, verses 20 and 21. You see, it will be freed from its slavery to decay. Creation itself will be freed in that sense. It's what the Bible calls the new heavens and new earth. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 3, also mentioned in Isaiah. It is this divine utopia in which Christians will dwell forever in resurrection bodies and in which there will be no evil, no death, no mourning, no crying, no suffering, no pain. All of the brokenness, all of the fragmentation will be healed. And we will live forever in that reality. That's the promise. That's the Christian hope, and it has been for millennia. Now, some have misread certain texts as being at odds with the notion of our eternal existence being lived out in a redeemed creation. They've looked at things and said, no, no, I'm, this is it. That there is no physicality to the redeemed creation. There is no new heaven and new earth. But that's not the right way to look at these. When Jesus said in John 18.36 that his kingdom is not of this world. You see, he's... He, he wasn't saying that it had nothing to do with the physical world. So that, no, my kingdom's not of this world. My kingdom is solely a non-physical spiritual thing. That's not what he means at all. He was saying that his kingdom doesn't originate or derive from the world. His kingdom originates and derives from God. It is not by worldly conquest or worldly power, any of that stuff. Colin Cruz says in his commentary on John, he says, Jesus was saying that his kingdom is given by God, not established by human struggle. His kingdom is active in this world and would one day come with power, but its power is not of the world, it's of God. That's what he means. My kingdom is not of this world. Luke 17, 21 should be translated, the kingdom of God is among you or in your midst, rather than the kingdom of God is within you or in you. There's a reason it has been translated as in your midst or among you by the New American Standard, New American Standard, updated, revised standard, new revised standard, new English Bible, revised English Bible, English standard, new international, new, new English translation, new Jerusalem Bible. The NIV, the NIV went with within you, but changed it in the TNIV to in your midst. There is a reason for that. And as the notes to the New English translation say, in your midst is a far better translation than in you. 
Jesus would never tell the hostile Pharisees that the kingdom was inside them. The references to Jesus present in their midst, he brings the kingdom. That's the point when he says, he says, the kingdom of God is among you in my person. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm the one who's bringing it. I'm among you. The kingdom of God is in your midst. So that verse shouldn't be used to argue that the kingdom of God is some kind of internal perception that's divorced from anything physical. Okay? That's not what is being talked about. That's not what it means. The reference in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 to the resurrected and transformed saints being caught up together in the clouds to meet, to meet the descending Lord in the air doesn't mean we're going, this is our beginning takeoff and then we're just carted off somewhere. That's not what it means at all. In fact, the word there, to meet, likely is a technical term that refers to the ancient civic custom of going out and publicly welcoming important visitors to the city where you go out and you then accompany them back into the city. Daniel Lewis says in his book, Three Crucial Questions About the Last Days, what this word envisions is Christians leaving the gates of the world to welcome Christ back as he returns to earth. So here he comes and we accompany him back. You see, not some, oh, oh, this is our takeoff to some non-physical reality. Let me read to you what Wayne Grudem says in his Systematic Theology. He says, We as resurrected men and women will live forever in new heavens and a new earth in which, in which righteousness dwells, 2 Peter 3.13. We will live in a renewed earth that will be set free from its bondage to decay, Romans 8.21, and become like a new Garden of Eden. In this very material, physical, renewed universe, it seems that we will need to live as human beings with physical bodies suitable for life in God's renewed physical creation. Specifically, Jesus' physical resurrection body affirms the goodness of God's original creation of man, not as a mere spirit like the angels, but as a creature with a physical body that was very good. We must not fall into the error of thinking that non-material existence is somehow a better form of existence for creatures. When God made us as the pinnacle of his creation, he gave us physical bodies. And so the way I look at it is creation itself will, in analogy to our resurrection, there will be continuity and discontinuity. This is who will come out, but he will be radically changed. This creation, there will be continuity, but it will be, in essence, resurrected. It will be transformed as we will be, and we will live there forever at home with the Lord. i got a little bit more to say about this next week, and then I hope to finish that, and then say something about the intermediate state of the dead, meaning the state of the dead between, uh, as we await the resurrection. What about, what's that state while we are awaiting the resurrection? I heard that bell, a little bit over, thanks.